Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so the first speaker of the session is Michael Nerig, who well, we know in the crypto community as the co-discoverer of the BN elliptic curves, and we are talking about implementing pairings today. Thank you. So, well, good morning, everybody. It's nice that so many came back this morning. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. That's really great. So, my talk will be about, yeah, as Alfred said, uh, pairing computation. Although I'm not going to go so much into the detail of the implementation, a little bit in the middle part, but it's more like about parameter selection and algorithms to compute pairings. So the talk is, has three main parts. I'll give some general stuff in the beginning about pairings and pairing-friendly curves. And of course, we'll have a look at some BN cur curves, in particular uh, a subfamily of BN curves, which are very, very uh, nice for implementation. And then the second part, I'm going to describe an implementation um, that actually Peter Schwab and Ruben Niederhagen did uh, uh, of the optimal eight pairing on a BN curve using the polynomial parameterization of the primes to uh, implement the field arithmetic. And the third part will uh, take a look at using affine coordinates for pairing computation. Okay, so. Let me start. Uh, we've seen most of this yesterday already, so it's just to fix notation. Um, we'll talk about elliptic curves over some field FQ, finite field FQ. And I'm going to denote by n the number of FQ rational points on that curve, and that's q plus 1 minus t, where t is the trace of Frobenius. That's all known. And we'll take a, a large prime divisor r of n. That's the size of the group we usually do crypto with. And then the embedding degree uh, of E with respect to this R is the smallest positive integer K such that R divides Q to the K minus 1. That's a very important parameter for pairings, as we'll see soon. And yeah, we have these three properties down here. So of course, K is the order of Q modulo R. And that's also the reason uh, why, if you choose an arbitrary, like an, a random elliptic curve, then that's the reason why this k is usually very large, uh, about the order of uh, r, actually. And furthermore, we have, of course, that the r roots of unity are contained in the finite field extension fq to the k. And also, if that k is larger than 1, um, we have all our torsion points on the curve already defined over fq to the k. So that's basically uh, the reason why I will fix our universe for today is fq to the k or the, the curve e of over fq to the k. We don't need any larger fields here. Yeah, so for practical uh, applications of pairings, we usually use uh, yeah, variants of the Tate-Lichtenbaum pairing, which is uh, the explicit version described by Lichtenbaum of the Tate pairing. And you can see why the embedding degree is so important. Basically, it works all over things defined over fq to the k. So <clears throat> yeah, the pairing takes two points. First uh, point is from the R torsion group. And the second is, uh, gives uh, some class in this quotient. And this is mapped over to uh, the field fq to the k star modulo r powers. Um, yeah, so, so the, tearing is actually, uh, the, the pairing is actually a function, FRP, um, which is given by this divisor, RP minus R times the point at infinity. And it's evaluated um, at some divisor given by the point Q. So for people to implement this, this is already too complicated. So uh, we're going to try to make things easier by uh, first restricting the first coordinate to uh, points defined over FQ. And for suitable uh, circumstances, we can also take the second uh, argument just as, a, as an R torsion point, this time defined over the larger field. And if we have K is larger than 1, we can replace the divisor by the point Q. So it's basically just a function given by some point P 
evaluated at some point q and then raised to the to this exponent to give a unique value an r roots of u, root of unity so we get rid of these uh, classes over here and yeah that's basically the the thing we start from yeah, we've seen this yesterday already but i have much nicer pictures with colors <laughs> so um, this is the standard group law on an elliptic curve and actually these lines that occur here like the line through p1 and p2 and then the vertical line here um, these are the things you can use to build up the function that's what victor miller described yesterday already so you have these formulas over here so if you want to compute f m p of q for some integer m you can build that uh, by doing some square and multiply like a loop using these formulas so you start with f0 which is 1 and then you build up that and you um, you always evaluate directly at the point q uh, if you think of how large the degree of that polynomial for example over uh, would be if you don't plug in the point q that's i mean the degree is, is m so you have a really huge um, function so you want to plug in the point q directly and then only compute with the values um, yeah so I've also put an Edwards curve down here because you don't need to work with line functions. So for, for Edwards curves, which are quadratic curves, it doesn't work with line functions. So in that case, you just replace the line function in the numerator by a quadratic function, this, this blue one here. So if you want to add P1 and P2 on the Edwards curve, you need to find that blue function, which is a quadratic that goes through the points p1, p2, this point O prime down here, and the points in it inf at infinity. And then Bezu's theorem gives you an eighth intersection point. So because the points at infinity uh, have multiplicity two, you get four of them. Then you have these three points is in total seven, and then you get one more intersection point. So that's the group law on Edwards curves. And you can just replace that function by the quadratic and that function by the product of that line and the line that goes through the uh, y-axis. And then the algorithm works just the same. So what I would just want to point out here is that what you have to do, you have to do computations and these computations are basically you have to do curve arithmetic to compute these points so you have to keep track of the points you uh, come along and um, you have to compute in the field fq to the k, namely by squaring this value and multiplying by the fraction of these line functions. And that's the reason you need to have a small embedding degree k, because if that's too large, you just can't do the computations. So we're going to make things even more easy. We're going to restrict to some common choices for the groups we compute the pairings on. So the first, that's what we already did for the Tate pairing. We just re restrict to a point defined over the base field. And the second group we're going to choose as the Q eigenspace of the Frobenius endomorphism, also known as the trace zero group. And yeah, we'll see why we, we're going to do this. And then we have basically two variants of pairings we compute, namely like the, something like the reduced state pairing where the first point is small defined over the base field and the second is taken from G2, so defined over the large field. And then we have a second uh, possibility, namely the eight pairing where we just change the order of these groups. So the first point is a larger point, the second one is the smaller. The advantage of this is that you see here it's not FR anymore, it's FT, and T is basically the trace of the Frobenius. So that value is much smaller than R. And if you think of the square and multiply Miller loop, then this will, can be computed in uh, half the number of iterations um, than the Tate pairing. Yeah, so there are even more efficient variants, namely so-called optimal eight pairings, and they have even smaller values for here so that t can be replaced by fm uh, by m 
And the notion of optimal eight pairings uh, means that this, uh, the length of M is um, actually the length of R divided by uh, the Euler Totian function of the embedding degree. We'll see an example for an optimal eight pairing later. So these are basically the versions. I'm not talking about any special type, so I want to restrict to just these choices for this talk. OK, so we have this group G2, uh, G2 here, which, is, which consists of points, of R torsion points defined over uh, the large field FQ to the K. And that's annoying we have, uh, if we have so large elements. And we can actually use a twist of E to represent that group nicely. Um, that's the main reason actually we choose this group because it can be represented very nicely. So for, for this talk, uh, we will, um, yeah, we'll define a twist E prime of E as a curve which is isomorphic to E over F to the, to the K. That's what I said in the beginning. My, uh, our universe today is FQ to the K, so nothing larger than that. So a twist E prime of E is a curve isomorphic over that universe. And yeah, as you might almost all know that these twists look like this and the isomorphism looks very simple. It's just uh, multiplying the uh, coefficients with uh, omega squared and omega cubed for some element in FQ to the K star. OK, so if, I mean, the, and the isomorphism is defined over FQ to the K. But if the curve is defined over some smaller field, um, and we have like a divisor D of K such that E prime is defined over FQ to the K over D, we say that, and no smaller field, uh, and the isomorphism is defined over FQ to K and no smaller field, we say that D has, uh, that the twist has degree uh, D. And there are not so many possibilities for the twist degrees. The, uh, yeah, for an arbitrary curve in general, it's just d equals to, uh, 2. If we have special j invariants like uh, 12 cubed, then we have uh, the coefficient b is 0 of the curve. So then we can have twists of degree 4 and 2. And for j invariant 0, we can have twists of degree 2, 3, and 6. That's all that is possible. And yeah, so the good thing is that we can say that there's always a unique twist E prime um, of degree given by that GCD over here. So if we take uh, D to be a divisor of K, then it's always uh, degree D. So the best thing we could hope for is that we get a, a twist of degree six. And there's a unique twist such that our prime R divides the group order of that twist. There's a nice treatment of this in the original eight pairing paper that explains all that. Sorry, why is it unique? If I keep twisting FQ elements, they're all. I mean, you can write down the possible group orders for twists. That's what they do in the eight pairing paper. And then you can see that it's only one possibility uh, of these group orders that can be divisible. But there are several equations. Yes. yes. Okay. So we're going to fix one of these equations. I'm just saying that, yeah. So we, I should say uh, there's a possible, there's one, exactly one group order. Um, yeah, right. So now we take this twist and we define the group G2 prime, which is just the group of R torsion points on E prime defined over that uh, smaller field FQ to the K over D. And then our twisting isomorphism is, defines a group isomorphism from G2 prime to G2. So here are some pictures, and I've uh, put that here. So that G2 prime is, is, lies in here and has points defined over a smaller field, and then psi maps over to G2. And yeah, if we now, in addition, also represent uh, the field extensions uh, we work in, so FQ to the K, with this same element omega, then that's very convenient because elements in FQ to the K can be written as polynomials in omega with uh, coefficients in FQ to the K over D. 
So that twist isomorphism just uh, takes the coefficients and puts them at the right places in the new elements. So that's very convenient. There's nothing to compute. And you can see that these uh, group elements from G2 are actually very special. They are kind of sparse you know, they, because they all come from elements in G2 prime. If you want, you could also think of what happens if, you, if I go back from G1. Then you will end up in, over here in G1 prime. And that will look very similar. It's just coefficients put at the right places. But in this talk, we're only going to use uh, G2 prime. OK, so now we've got all the stuff we need to talk about pairing computation. But now we need curves to compute pairings on. And we need to fulfill some security requirements. <clears throat> so this table I've taken from uh, recommendations by NIST and eCrypt2. Um, and what it says is actually it gives a level of security. And it says there are equivalent sizes. So there are certain sizes for the parameters that give equivalent levels of security. So for example, if you want to have 128-bit security, you need to take an elliptic curve with 256 uh, bits for the prime R. And the extension field should be something like that, 3,000 bits. And yeah, so I'm actually not talking about any special assumptions. That's basically the minimal requirement that at least the DLPs should be difficult enough. And now the pairing has this embedding degree, uh, so, uh, the, the curve we compute the pairing on. And that embedding degree links the sizes of the prime R and the uh, final field FQ to the K. So that's very nicely represented down here. Um, that value rho is basically a measure for how far the curve is from having a prime number of rational points over the base field. So the size of q is actually rho times the size of r. And then you get k times the same thing to get the size of the extension field. So the factor between the prime r and the extension field is rho times k. And from these minimal requirements here, you can deduce kind of an optimal factor for that. Yeah? So in the 128-bit level, it comes out to be around 12. Um, so for efficiency reasons, you might want to balance the security. So for example, first of all, you want to have the row value as close to 1 as possible. I mean, it's good to have a prime order curve. So you don't need to compute with too large uh, Primes Q or prime powers Q here. And also, if this factor OK is too large, um, then you will have to fulfill a minimal size for R, and that makes your finite field way too large for that same security level. The other way around, if it's too small, you will have to increase the size for your finite field, and which makes the group and the elliptic curve actually too large for that security level. So if you believe in these recommendations, then a good thing to do would be to choose rho k as close as possible to these optimal values in the table. Yeah, so we need a small k, and we need rho times k to be close to these values. And we would like to have a twist degree as large as possible. So there are quite some uh, constraints on the uh, choice of curves we can make. So as uh, Professor Koblitz said yesterday already, super singular curves always have small embedding degree. In large characteristic, it's uh, at most 2. And for characteristic 3 and 2, we can have uh, k up to 6. So they were the natural first choice. Uh, that's when they came back from their grave, and people were computing pairings on them. But you can see rho times k is quite small. So you would have to make the fields very large to get a certain security level. So I'm going to focus on ordinary curves in this talk. We'll hear, hear something about super singular uh, curves, pairings on super singular curves tomorrow, uh, I guess, in both talks on pairings. So to get a larger embedding degree and larger uh, rho times k, we might want to go to ordinary curves. So what do we need? We need 
uh, curves with the following properties. That's the standard thing for the group order. We need a prime divisor of that group order. We also need the embedding degree condition. And we need to find that curve. And we usually that should be done by using the CM method. I mean, if you choose some curve, uh, as already mentioned uh, several times, then the embedding degree is just enormous. You can't compute. So we, you have to fix that in advance. So fix the embedding degree and then try to fulfill these equations. And that should look familiar from Francois Morin's talk yesterday. If you have that formula fulfilled, then you can use the CM method to construct the curve. The only restriction is that you, find, you can find the Hilbert class polynomial. So that D should be suitable or small enough such that you can actually compute that and then find the curve. <clears throat> OK, so these are the restrictions. And usually, it's done by, so for these examples for the security levels uh, I showed you earlier, it's usually done by selecting polynomials that uh, par parameterize these parameters, n, p, and t, and that already fulfill these conditions as polynomials. And the only thing you need to do is to plug in values, integers, until you find these things to be prime, p and r. And that's all nicely described in the famous taxonomy paper that has basically all the constructions that are out there. Um, and in this table, I've put some examples that kind of fulfill these balanced uh, security requirements. Um, so for the 128 level, of course, BN curves, they, they have an embedding degree of 12 and rho equals 1, so that exactly fits the NIST requirements. Although one might have to adjust the security a bit by increasing the bit size a few bits because you have uh, these endomorphisms of degree six and um, very special parameterization. So um, anyway, um, yeah, so th these are the uh, names of these uh, constructions in the taxonomy paper. So if you want to look at that later, you can use the slide to find that in, uh, in the paper. So just to give you an idea what we can have here. So the upper things are always the ones with the higher degree twists. Um, and yeah, rho value equal, equal to 1 is just possible for a few families. So the BN curves, Freeman curves for k equals 10, and MNT curves, which are ordinary curves that have embedding degree less or equal to 6. Um, yeah, the, all the others, for all the other examples, you can't find prime order uh, curves. OK, and then you might want to look at, at the last column here. So that gives you the degree of the field you have to do the computations in. Yeah? For, the, for the eight pairing, you will replace G2 by G2 prime, and that's defined over this degree extension of FQ. OK. So very nice example are these VN curves. They are given by these two polynomials. So P and N are given by degree 4 polynomials. And the good thing is that if you look down here, the CM equation by accident comes out to be minus 3 times the square all the time. So um, they all have CM by the field Q square root minus 3. And therefore, all the J so they have always J invariant 0. And that's the reason for the curve shape here. And yeah, it's possible to find curves with a prime order so that n is equal to r and is prime. So what you, what you need to do here to construct such curves is just plug in values for u until you find those two polynomials to give you prime numbers. That's all. Once you have that, you can try certain different values for b and check the order of the group to see if you have the right twist, or you can actually immediately compute that order, because for these curves, you can just write it down. <clears throat> OK, the embedding degree is 12, as already said. And the twist of degree 6, yeah, in the, that curve shape, we have such a twist. Yeah, it's of course given somehow by uh, that coefficient, b over psi. And yeah, so to construct this twist, you will try just certain values for, for xi until you find the right one that gives you the right uh, group order. 
So what does it mean for our computations? The group G2 prime is defined over FP squared, so we basically only have to do computations over FP squared. So for the eight pairing, curve arithmetic is in uh, E prime of FP squared. So we'll just basically always replace the points in the large group by the small ones on the twist. Um, yeah. And then you can also represent the curve, uh, the field extensions using that same value psi from the twist. So you have this nice convenient representation that uh, goes along with the twist isomorphism. So that's the algorithm for the optimal eight pairing on BN curves. It looks a bit uh, yeah, confusing, but it's basically just a few parts. So you can look here. The parameter m is just 6u plus 2. And that's of size 1 fourth the size of r, uh, because the uh, n was given by a degree 4 polynomial. Yeah? So now we have a linear polynomial in u. And then we have this, uh, that's the Miller loop. That's the square and multiply like part here where you have these doubling steps. You compute the double of the point and then you do this squaring times the line function. So I've already thrown out all the denominator line functions because uh, that's what you can do for even embedding degree. They all lie. So by choosing this G2 in the way we did, they all lie in subfields and get uh, mapped to one by the final exponentiation. You have to do some adjustment if that parameter u is negative and then it's not only, so for the Tate pairing, you just have this Miller loop and then you're done. Uh, also for the eight pairing, but for the optimal pairings, you have to pay a little bit to get this uh, small order of the, of the function. So you have to do some Frobenius computations, two more of these addition steps. And then steps 14 to 16 are the final exponentiation. You can split that up into some Frobenius powers and multiplications, and you, you are left over with a so-called hard part of the final exponentiation, which is kind of a, a real exponentiation down here. So these are actually the things that are uh, computationally intensive. So here, all these doubling steps, you have multiplications in the large field. You have to compute the coefficients of the line functions, evaluate at p, do these multiplications after the squaring and the uh, uh, point computations. And then this is all not so expensive, and then you get this uh, large exponentiation down here. OK, so let's have a look at how to choose suitable curves that make this algorithm more efficient. So for example, if you have uh, that parameter m, 6u plus 2, very sparse, you don't need to go into that if statement so often. Yeah, that's good. That saves you computation. Also, if the value u itself is sparse, has a lot of uh, zeros in its binary representation, then you can do that part of the final exponentiation down here very efficiently. So that's really essential to um, choose these things in that way. We will see later. And then you might want to choose p congruent to 3 mod 4 to get that nice representation for the quadratic field. So you have a lot of computations of FP squared, and that will make that very efficient. Although maybe Francisco will uh, have a different view on that tomorrow. So um, I would say that this is the best choice. And then you might want to choose xi as small as possible. Uh, we'll see what that means in a few seconds. So. There have been some very fast pairing implementations out there uh, which just look at the efficiency of the actual pairing algorithm. But if you do protocols, you want to also have efficient curve scalar multiplication. And you might need to hash to the curve. That means currently you have to compute square roots or cube roots. So you might think of about that as well. So um, also there are some protocols designed for constraint devices where actually these devices don't compute any pairings at all. Pairings are computed somewhere where you have power to compute them. And then if you yeah, increase pairing efficiency by paying with a less efficient scalar multiplication, then that's also not a good thing to do. So even you could use Edwards curves to get a very fast scalar multiplication. You can compute pairings. You're not as flexible, and, uh, but still, I mean, 
it could be the best choice. All right. So, um, yeah. The next two slides are actually just about a nice subfamily of these BN curves that we actually just came up with to show that you can choose BN curves as nice as you want because there are a lot of them, there are enough curves. And um, for example, you can, if you choose that element psi in a way such that its norm over fp squared gives you the parameter p, then you al already know which is the right twist to use. So you don't need to check for the order and stuff like that. So that's just very uh, basic. Uh, some basic calculations and using the fact that these curves don't have points of order two and three. So we suggest the following things. So you should choose your BN curves as follows. You should choose a low weight U and such that you get a low weight 6U plus 2, as already mentioned earlier. P convert to 3 mod 4 to get the nice quadratic field extension. And then you choose a small psi in this shape. And that gives you b like this, so c to the 4 plus d to the 6. And you plug, on, plug in some small integers to, and, uh, to try. I mean, you, have to, you still have to try to find a right, uh, the right b value. Yeah? That's the thing you need to do. So you need to plug in some values for c and d that gives you the correct b, and then everything else is fixed. So the advantage of this is you get an obvious point on the curve, which is minus d squared times uh, comma c squared. And you also get an obvious point on the twist, which is this point. So once you fix c and d, you can compute all that very easily. You get all these generators. I mean, that's not something you, you need for efficient computation, but it's a very nice representation of these curves. And you can choose it all in a way that gives a very efficient pairing algorithm. So one example curve is this. So the u is very sparse, just three minus one values in the NAF representation. And you can choose c equals one and d equals one. So this information is all you need to, to describe all the parameters you need for pairing computation. That might be useful for putting curves in certificates or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's really not much information. And then from that, you can compute everything. You get these nice generators if you uh, want to send them, ar them around, that's not much uh, information. You have a very small psi here. So multiplication by that thing is just two additions in fp squared. And the twist looks like this. Also, b and b prime, so b over psi, are kind of small because uh, current really fast formulas for computing the pairings use these values b. And if they are small, that's uh, better. OK, so these are some suggestions for BN curves. OK, so we'll come to the second part of my talk, which is about an, a pairing implementation. And I mean, these pairing-friendly curves are very special. They have this special embedding degree uh, condition. And also, most of them are given by polynomials. Yeah? So, the, so the primes are given by polynomials, so that's special structure. So the question is, could we use that to make arithmetic uh, more efficient? And actually, uh, Van Verkauter and Fabawe did, demonstrated this for in a hardware setting where they um, yeah, showed that you can use this polynomial representation to get uh, very fast algorithms. And here they choose a u that it's kind of a, almost a power of two. It's just a power of two plus some small thing that makes uh, the polynomials prime, give, give you prime values. The problem is that uses, uh, essentially uses the fact that you can build specially sized multipliers in hardware. You can build multipliers that have certain, that multiply certain small numbers with larger ones, and that's more efficient than a general multiplication, which you don't have in software. You can just, just use what you have. Uh, so their approach is not exactly what we can do in software. So the question is, does it work in software? So um, if you look at Dan Bernstein's paper, uh, Curve 25519, then you see that he does some similar things there. He represents um, 
the elements in, in some strange rings. And so if we do it like here, we can just write down that polynomial P. So we introduce uh, another variable. We write it as polynomials over some variable X. And then you can write that P in these two different shapes. And if you plug in one, you get back the value of the prime P. So what we can do now, we can represent our elements in FP by just using the same representation here. So we put coefficients here and kind of have a, have a representation with certain different sizes for the coefficient. I mean, it's not unique. We, we can just use it. Uh, we can have several different uh, representations of a number. It's just we need to have that f of 1 is equal to f. So the arithmetic in, we would do arithmetic now by multiplying polynomials and then plugging uh, 1 in at the end. So if you have two such elements, multiply them, you get uh, an element of degree 6. That gives you seven coefficients. And then you want to get back something with four coefficients, of course. And then you can use the polynomial representation, this, this p thing, to, to reduce the degree of the polynomial. And that actually looks very simple. Yeah? So you get these formulas. That's the degree reduction. So you do something like a school book multiplication on polynomials and then reduce the degree again. The problem is that doesn't really help. That's not really more efficient than, for example, Montgomery multiplication. Uh, the reason is you, you will have to do reductions all the time, just as in Montgomery. And then probably Montgomery rep representation is the more efficient thing to do. So again, the, it's the problem with the hardware. I mean, we get coefficients. So if you multiply these things with 64-bit coefficients. The product has 128-bit coefficients. And then you add something during the algorithms that makes these things grow. You have to do reductions all the time. So if you had a hardware a realization, you could make a bit larger uh, registers, and then it would work. So the idea we, have is, uh, we had is, OK, let's take more coefficients and put it in some variables such that there's space. The problem is we need to restrict to third powers of u. And that's a really strong restriction. OK, anyway, so we, we take 12 coefficients like that. And then a 256-bit number we represent by these 12 coefficients. And then this, this v thing has 21 bits. Yeah? u was uh, about 1 quarter of uh, r, so 256. That's u is about 63 bits, and then v is 21. So what happens if you multiply two such elements, you get double the size of the coefficients. And if we put all these things in double precision floats, then there's still space for doing some additions without uh, having to do uh, coefficient reductions. Yeah? So we use double precision floating points and can do some computations without doing the reductions. But of course, there's some point you reach the limit of the size of these uh, variables. So you have to do some coefficient reductions. And that's what we do it just like with, uh, with round functions. Um, so that's just computing modulo 6v and computing modulo v. And then you get like a balanced representation where these things are between minus 3v and 3v and, and so on. And again, if you get a carry from the last coefficient, you use the polynomial representation to reduce back to the other coefficients. So how Peter and Ruben implemented this, they used the vector instructions, small pd and add pd, from which you can actually do two in one instruction. So you have these zimd uh, registers and instruction, and you can do two multiplications and two additions. Um, the problem is if you do FP arithmetic with that, you will have to always make sure that the right things are in the right places to actually use these things. Yeah, so have, you have to do shuffling and, and recombining and things like that. Um, the solution to this problem is that you directly implement FP squared arithmetic, because that naturally gives you some kind of parallelism where you have things. Uh, so if you write down the elements and FP squared elements interleaved, you take the coefficients from the first and then the the zero coefficient from the second and so on, you more often have 
already the same things at the right, uh, the, the, the right things at the right places. Um, yeah. So then we use school book multiplications, so no Karatsuba because that's an even number of multiplications you can do in parallel, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and then per multiplication you have to do at least one polynomial reduction and two coefficient reductions. Yeah, there's one nice thing I should mention. So, of course, it will become more efficient if you take out reductions. So that was actually the plan yeah, when we took these uh, variables that you have some space to re take out reductions. And so Peter wrote a class that always takes care of these, uh, of the maximal values that you can get. So you, we just plugged that in and he tried how far does it work. And then we need to do a reduction in the, again and so on and so forth. And then in the end it was re-implemented in, in CASM in assembly. So the results. So currently we have kind of a performance like this. So four million cycles to compare with what was published before. Uh, there was a paper by Hankerson, Menezes and Scott from 2008. They gave for the same security level, BN curves, optimal eight pairing. It was the R8 pairing, but it's almost the same algorithm. And they gave like 10,000 cycles and we asked Mike Scott and he sent us back something like that for a newer version of the parameters. And we were quite happy that this was uh, so fast. And then a few weeks later, some people came along and made a very fast implementation of the optimal eight pairing. Now, I'm not going to talk about that very much because that's uh, tomorrow at the same time. Francisco will explain to you what they did to get these performances. So if you have a look at this table down here where we also give the um, cycle counts for multiplication and squaring in FP squared, then you see that actually our paper is uh, currently a bit faster just looking at the multiplications. But the total pairing is slower. And the reasons for this is that, so the main reason actually is that we have to restrict to this condition here, a third power of V. And that restricts the choice of curves so much that we can't use these nice uh, curves and the other guys actually use a very nice curve, so very sparse parameters and everything. So that's the main reason it, it doesn't work so nicely. Also, it wasn't possible to remove as many reductions as we thought. So there are still too many reductions in there. So that takes time. And multiplication is not really much faster. So for software, it seems it doesn't really pay off to use the polynomial representation. Yeah, so the reasons for multiplication not being faster is that we use schoolbook to, to have this parallel structure, so an even number of multiplications. And, by, and still we have to put things at the right places, so that also takes some time here. But still, it's not that bad. <laughs> and um, yeah, it seems that still Montgomery multiplication, that's what the others use, is the best thing to do for software. But maybe if we try to compute pairings on other architectures where floating points are faster, then um, maybe our approach will be better. Okay, that's the second part. So um, if you're bored and you want to do something else, you can think of why our paper is called DCLXVI and talk to me after the talk. Okay. So. <laughs> So the third part um, actually deals with the, co uh, the coordinate system choice for, for pairings. Uh, you have to do um, curve arithmetic, so you have to decide which coordinate system you use. So, and I wanted to show you this citation from Stephen from the year 2005. He said, one can use projective coordinates for the operations in E of FQ. The performance analysis depends on the relative costs of inversion to multiplication in FQ, and experiments show that affine coordinates are faster. So that was 2005, that was before BN curves, and that was uh, with super singular curves. In the meantime, the picture has changed. 
I mean, for ECC, it's uh, clear that you will use projective coordinates because finite field inversions in prime fields are very expensive to compare to multiplications. And you want to avoid these inversions by uh, doing some more multiplications. And also for pairings, I mean, the current speed records, our implementation, as well as the one by Francisco and the others, use projective formulas. It seems to be the best to do there. But still, um, maybe one should rethink about using uh, affine coordinates. So the reasons for this is that in some cases we can have quite efficient inversions. Uh, so for example, if you work in extension fields. So here, the example of a quadratic extension given by that polynomial. Um, yeah, you can compute the inverse by basically computing the inverse of the norm of that element, which is an inversion in the base field. So to invert in FP squ FQ squared, you invert in the base field and do some additional multiplications. Yeah, you have to compute these squares. and So you have to compute the norm first, then invert that, and then multiply by the coefficients. So an inversion in FQ squared should be less than one inversion in the base field plus these uh, operations, two multiplications, two squarings, a multiplication by omega, and so on. And this means that the ratio of inversion to multiplication uh, becomes smaller. Yeah? So if we assume that a, a multiplication in the larger field with Karatsuba takes at least three multiplications, then this ratio will be roughly one-third plus some constant. So going up in extension fields makes your inversions by a certain ratio better. Uh, in this case, it's roughly one-third. So in general, for a degree L extension, so what I'm telling you is all old stuff that's well known. And it's basically a generalization of the Itotsuji inversion algorithm. It's a standard way to compute inverses in optimal extension fields. Um, and you can do that in general. Yeah? You, in, you can invert an element in some extension field by computing the norm, beta to the nu, inverting that, and then multiplying by that element raised to, to this exponent here. So b minus 1. And if you sit down and think about uh, the exact costs for, for these algorithms, you, get, you end up with something like that. So, in a degree three extension, for example, you get roughly one sixth the ratio plus some constant here, and so on. So you can see the larger the field extension gets, the, the better your inversion with respect to multiplication will be in the end. Also, another trick, also very well known, I don't know which one of Peter's tricks it is, but it. The, it's so one of the tricks that come up in these uh, that came up in these uh, uh, papers on uh, the ECM method. So very well known. You of course, if you compute, if you want to invert two elements in parallel, then you compute the product, invert the product, and do two more multiplications to get the inverses. Yeah. So you replace two inversions by one inversion plus three multiplications. In general, that works just as for two elements. You compute all these products. You invert the last one, and then you can get back the elements by always two multiplications. So in total, you replace s inversions by one inversion and three times s minus one multiplications. And that gives you an average inversion to multiplication ratio of, yeah, roughly three, if s is large enough. So we have two um, ways of improving the inversion to multiplication ratio. One is this thing when you are able to do several inversions at once. Um, this has nothing to do with field extension. On the other hand, we have that property that in extension fields you get a better ratio. So if you think back at the eight pairing algorithm and at the first table with the examples for the curve construction methods, then the last column gave you the extension degrees. And for the eight pairing, or variants of the eight pairing, which are the most efficient uh, pairing algorithms, you will end up doing computations exactly in that extension field. So if you compute the line function uh, values, you compute a slope um, of, of the line function, and you have to do an inversion in that extension field. So that's the, the case if you use affine coordinates. 
So it might be actually a good a thing to use affine coordinates. Uh, if your inversions are cheap already, which is usually not the case, or for eight pairings, if you go at, to very high security levels where you have large extension degrees, then you can use these extension field tricks to improve your I to M ratio and get a better algorithm. And there might be reasons not to use these very special curves with a fixed chain variance 0 or uh, 1728. So people might uh, want to use more general curves that only have a degree 2 twist. And then this field extension is larger also. So in that case, it might help to use affine coordinates. Might be worth considering. Or if you, to come back to the second uh, trick, if you compute several pairings. There are a lot of protocols that actually compute many pairings. Or for the gold sahai uh, proof uh, systems, you compute products of pairings. And then you can do that in parallel. And, and uh, yeah, not really in parallel. You, you do it at once. You wait until you get to the inversions for all. And then you do the inversions um, at once and get, an, get a ratio of roughly 3. So there are some possible scenarios where it might be good to think about affine coordinates again. The reason we stumbled about this was when I was working on uh, Microsoft's pairing library. And uh, this is based on the big num library, which is basically written by Peter Montgomery. So that has uh, finite field arithmetic, field extensions, polynomials, elliptic curves, and all the stuff. So I was working on pairings over by using that uh, library. So what we did is we used the, the base field arithmetic from big num, so Peter's Montgomery multiplication. And uh, yeah, as usual, so 256-bit numbers are split into four pieces, and you do the usual Montgomery stuff. We have the extension fields. And I put in these inversion tricks I described before. Uh, and the whole thing is a C implementation. For the special case of 256-bit integers, we uh, have a little bit of assembly, but it's basically completely C. It's not restricted to any specific security level curves or processors. You can plug in any BN curve. So for the, you can even plug in other curves. But currently, we have the most stuff for BN curves. So you can plug in any curve, and it will work. It works on a 32-bit and 64-bit windows and yeah that's what you get for that's what we got for the field arithmetic if you compare the multiplications it's really much slower than these special uh, implementations i talked about earlier but i wanted to show you this last uh, column here which is the inversion to multiplication ratio so if you're given like an implementation with certain uh, properties then you see here in the 12 degree extension, an inversion is almost as cheap as a multiplication or as expensive as a multiplication. So if you would work over such large extension fields, you might want to do the inversions instead of using projective coordinates. Yeah, and then the pairing algorithms, it's basically the optimal eight pairing as shown before. And here you can see some, I mean, yeah, so that's the optimal eight pairing. It's 14, ab about 15 million cycles. And if you use the simultaneous inversion trick, it doesn't show too much here because the ratio in FP squared is already 5.3. If you reduce that to almost three, that's not a big, big deal here. So it becomes a little bit better. Um, Products of pairings can use more optimizations. You can just already accumulate uh, everything into one uh, Miller variable and, and save a lot of time. Good. If you want a details and a thorough analysis of how much more projective formulas cost, how much more the fastest projective formulas cost compared to affine coordinates and so on, you can look at the paper here. Thank you. Well, the obvious question, putting together parts two and parts three, who's going to do it? When's it going to happen? Sorry? You, you, I mean, you've been mentioning the, the possibility, maybe probability of speeding yeah. things up with that by 
coordinates, and you've been mentioning better multi-precision arithmetic. So when are we going to see an implementation that puts these things together and gets even better speed? Yeah, for BN curves, I mean, usually it wouldn't pay off to use the affine coordinates because uh, if you look at the speeds people get for, for these fastest implementations, um, then the projective formulas are much better. So it would only pay off for higher security levels. So, I mean, yeah, it's a good thing to try that, yeah. Well, it seems to me that the recommendations of taking a sparse parameter U will lead to a finite supply of curves. Yes. While your curve is VQ, will always work. No matter how large ah, okay. it V, but you still expect to get the same proportion. Right. Or the approach to take you to be a close to a power of two. So if you just a few curves, and then it will yeah. stop doing anything. Yes. You can get lucky a few times, but then it will mm -hmm. run out. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. More questions? Let's thank Michael for his talk.